Section 13 of Heart, a Schoolboy's Journal. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nemo. Heart, a Schoolboy's Journal by Edmondo de Amicis. Translated by Isabel Florence Hapgood. March. The Evening School, Thursday, 2nd. Last night, my father took me to see the Evening School in our Boretti schoolhouse, which was all lighted up, and where the working men were already beginning to enter. On our arrival, we found the principal and the teachers very indignant, because a little while before, the glass in one window had been broken by a stone. The beetle had darted forth and seized a boy, who was passing, but thereupon Stadi, who lives in the house opposite, had come forward and said, This is not the right one. I saw it with my own eyes. It was Franti who threw it, and he said to me, You'll catch it if you tell, but I am not afraid. The principal declared that Franti should be expelled for good. In the meantime, I was watching the working men enter by twos and threes, and more than two hundred had already entered. I have never seen anything so fine as the evening school. There were boys of twelve and upwards, bearded men who were on their way from their work, carrying their books and copy books, carpenters, engineers with black faces, masons with hands white with plaster, baker's boys with their hair full of flour, and one could smell varnish, hides, fish, oil, odors of all the various trades. There also entered a squad of artillery workmen, dressed like soldiers and headed by a corporal. They all filed briskly to their benches, removed the board underneath on which we put our feet, and immediately bent their heads over their work. Some stepped up to the teachers to ask explanations, with their open copy-books in their hands. I caught sight of the young and well-dressed master, the little lawyer, who had three or four working men clustered around the table, and who was making corrections with his pen, and also the lame one, who was laughing with the dyer who had brought him a copy-book, all adorned with red and blue dyes. My teacher, who had recovered, and who will return to school tomorrow, was there also. The doors of the schoolroom were open. I was amazed when the lessons began, to see how attentive they all were, and how they kept their eyes fixed on their work. Yet the greater part of them, so the principal said, for fear of being late, had not even been home to eat a mouthful of supper and they were hungry. But the younger ones, after half an hour of school, were falling off the benches with sleep. Some even went fast asleep with their heads on the bench, and the teacher awakened them by tickling their ears with a pen. But the grown-up men did nothing of the sort. They kept awake and listened, with their mouths wide open, without even winking. It seemed strange to me to see all those bearded men on our benches. We also went up to the floor above, and I ran to the door of my schoolroom, where I saw in my seat a man with a big mustache and a bandaged hand, who might have injured himself while at work about some machine. But he was trying to write, though very very slowly. What pleased me most was to behold in the seat 
of the little mason on the very same bench and in the very same corner his father the mason is huge as a giant who sat there all coiled up into a narrow space with his chin on his fist and his eyes on his book so absorbed that he hardly breathed and there was no chance about it or it was he himself who said to the principal the first evening he came to the school senior director do me the favor to place me in the seat of my hare's face for he always calls his son so my father kept me there until the end and in the street we saw many a women with children in their arms waiting for their husbands at the entrance a change was effected the husbands took the children in their arms and the women took their books and copy books and in this wise they proceeded to their homes for several minutes the street was filled with people and with noise then it grew silent and all we could see was the tall weary form of the principal going away the fight sunday fifth it was what might have been expected franti on being expelled by the principal wanted to revenge himself on stardi and after school he waited for stardi at a corner when he was passing with his sister whom he escorts every day from an institute in the dora grossa street my sister sylvia on leaving her schoolhouse saw the whole affair and came home thoroughly terrified this is what took place franti with his cap of wax cloth tilted over one ear ran up on tiptoe behind stardi and in order to provoke him gave a tug at his sister's braid of hair a tug so violent that it almost threw her on the ground the little girl uttered a cry her brother whirled around franti who was much taller and stronger than stardi thought he'll not utter a word or i'll break his skin for him but stardi never stopped to think small and ill-made as he is he flung himself with one bound on that big fellow and began to beat him with his fist he could not hold his own however and he got more than he gave there was no one in the street but girls so there was no one who could separate them franti flung him on the ground but the other instantly got up and then down he went on his back again and franti pounded away as though upon a door in an instant he had torn away half an ear and bruised one eye and drawn blood from stardi's nose but stardi was gritty he roared you may kill me but i'll make you pay for it down went franti again kicking and cuffing and stardi under him butting and striking out with his heels a woman cried from a window good for the little one others said it is a boy defending his sister courage give it to him well and they screamed at franti you bully you coward but franti had grown savage he held out his leg stardi tripped and fell with franti on top of him surrender no surrender no in a flash stardi was on his feet he clasped franti by the body and with one furious effort hurled him to the pavement and fell upon him with one knee on his breast ah the villain he has a knife shouted a man rushing up to disarm franti but stardi beside himself with rage 
had already grasped franti's arm with both hands and bitten the fist so fiercely that the knife fell from it and the hand began to bleed more people had run up in the meantime separated them and set them on their feet franti took to his heels in a sorry plight while stardi stood still with his face all scratched and with a black eye but triumphant beside his weeping sister while some of the girls collected the books and copy-books which were strewn over the street bravo little fellow said the bystanders he defended his sister but stardi who was thinking more of his satchel than of his victory instantly set to examining the books and copy-books one by one to see whether anything was missing or injured he rubbed them off with his sleeve looked over his pen put everything back in its place and then quiet and serious as usual he said to his sister let us go home quickly for i have a hard lesson before me the boy's parents monday sixth this morning big stardy the father came to wait for his son fearing lest he should again meet franti but they say that franti will not be seen again because he'll be put in a reform school there were a great many parents there this morning among the rest there was the retail wood dealer the father of coretti the perfect image of his son slender brisk with his moustache brought to a point and a ribbon of two colours in the buttonhole of his jacket i know nearly all the parents of the boys through constantly seeing them there there is one crooked grandmother with her white cap who comes four times a day whether it rains or snows or storms to bring and to get her little grandson of the upper primary and she takes off his little cloak and puts it on for him straightens his necktie brushes off the dust and takes care of the copy books it is evident that she has no other thought that she sees nothing in the world more beautiful the captain of artillery also comes frequently the father of robetti the lad with the crutches who saved a child from the omnibus and as all his son's companions salute him in passing he returns a salute to every one and he never forgets any he bends over all and the poorer and more badly dressed they are the more pleased he seems to be and he thanks them at times however sad sights are to be seen a gentleman who had not come for a month because one of his sons had died and who had sent a maid-servant for the other on coming yesterday and seeing the class the comrades of his little dead boy retired into a corner and burst into sobs with both hands before his face the principal took him by the arms and led him to his office there are fathers and mothers who know all their son's companions by name there are girls from the neighboring schoolhouse and scholars in the gymnasium who come to wait for their brothers there is one old gentleman who was a colonel formerly and who when a boy drops a copy-book or a pen picks it up for him there are also to be seen well-dressed ladies who discuss school matters with others who have kerchiefs on their heads and baskets on their arms and who say oh the problem has been a difficult one this time that grammar lesson will never come to an end and when there is a sick boy in the class they all know it when he is better they all rejoice this morning there were eight or ten ladies gentlemen and working men standing around crossi's mother the vegetable vendor making inquiries about a poor baby in my brother's class who lives in her court 
and who is in danger of his life. The school seems to make them all equals and friends. Number 78 Wednesday, 8th I saw a touching scene yesterday afternoon. For several days, every time that the vegetable vendor has passed Drosi, she has gazed and gazed at him with an expression of great affection. For Drosi, since he made the discovery about that inkstand in prisoner number 78, has acquired a love for her son, Crosi, the red-haired boy with the useless arm. Drosi helps him to do his work in school, suggests answers to him, gives him paper, pens, and pencils. In short, he behaves to him like a brother, as though to compensate him for his father's misfortune, which has affected him, although he does not know it. The vegetable vendor had been watching Derossi for several days, and she seemed loath to take her eyes from him, for she is a good woman who lives only for her son, and Derossi, who assists him and makes him appear well, Derossi, who is a gentleman and the head of the school, seems to her like a king, a saint. She continued to stare at him and seemed desirous of saying something to him, yet was ashamed to do it. But at last, yesterday morning, she took courage, stopped him in front of a gate, and said to him, I beg a thousand pardons, little master. Will you, who are so kind to my son and so fond of him, do me the favor to accept this little memento from a poor mother? and she pulled out of her vegetable basket a little pasteboard box of white and gold. Derossi flushed up all over and refused, saying with decision, Give it to your son. I will accept nothing. The woman was mortified and stammered an excuse. I had no idea of offending you, it is only caramels. But Drosi said no again and shook his head. Then she timidly lifted from her basket a bunch of radishes and said, Accept these at least. They are fresh and carry them to your mamma. Drosi smiled and said, No thanks. I don't want anything. I shall always do all that I can for Croce, but I cannot accept anything. I thank you all the same. But you are not at all offended? asked the woman, anxiously. Drosi said, No, no, smiled, and went off, while she exclaimed in great delight, Oh, what a good boy! I have never seen so fine and handsome a boy as he. And that appeared to be the end of it. But in the afternoon at four o'clock, instead of Croce's mother, his father came up with that gaunt, sad face of his. He stopped Derossi, and from the way in which he looked at the latter, I instantly understood that he suspected Derossi of knowing his secret. He looked at him intently and said in his tender, touching voice, You are fond of my son. Why do you like him so much? Drosi's face turned the color of fire. He would have liked to say, I am fond of him because he has been unfortunate, because you, his father, have been more unfortunate than guilty, and have nobly expiated your crime, and are a man of heart. But he had not the courage to say it, for at the bottom he still felt fear, and almost dread, in the presence of this man, who had shed another's blood, and had been six years in prison. But the latter divined it all, 
and lowering his voice, he said into Rossi's ear, almost trembling the while, You love the sun, but you do not hate, do not wholly despise the father, do you? Ah, no, no, quite the reverse, exclaimed Rossi, with a soulful impulse. The man made an impetuous movement, as though to throw one arm around his neck, but he dared not, and instead he took one of the lad's golden curls between two of his fingers, stroked it, and let it go. Then he kissed his palm to him, gazing at the rosy with moist eyes, as though to say that this kiss was for him, after which he took his son by the hand and went away at a rapid pace. A Little Dead Boy Monday, 13th The little boy who lived in the vegetable vendor's court, the one who belonged to the upper primary, and was the companion of my brother, is dead. Schoolmistress Delcati came in great affliction on Saturday afternoon to inform the master of it, and instantly Garone and Coretti volunteered to carry the coffin. He was a fine little lad. He had won the medal last week. He was fond of my brother, and had given him a broken money box. My mother always petted him when she met him. He wore a cap with two stripes of red cloth. His father is a porter on the railway. Yesterday, Sunday, afternoon, at half past four o'clock, we went to his house to go with a funeral to the church. They live on the ground floor. Many boys of the upper primary with their mothers all holding candles were there. Five or six teachers and several neighbors were already collected in the courtyard. The mistress with the red feather and mistress Delcati had gone inside, and through an open window we beheld them weeping. We could hear the mother of the child sobbing loudly. Two ladies mothers of two school companions of the dead child had brought garlands of flowers exactly at five o'clock we set out in front went a boy carrying a cross then a priest then the coffin a very very small coffin poor child covered with a black cloth and round it were wound the garlands brought by the two ladies on the black cloth on one side were fastened the medal and honorable mentions which the little boy had won in the course of the year. Garone, Coretti, and two boys from the courtyard bore the coffin. Behind the coffin first came Mr. Stalcati, who wept as though the little dead boy were her own. Behind her the other school mistresses, and behind the mistresses, the boys, among whom were some very little ones, who carried bunches of violets in one hand, and who stared wonderingly at the beer, while their other hand was held by their mothers, who carried candles. I heard one of them say, And shall I not see him at school again? When the coffin came from the court, a despairing cry was heard from the window. It was the child's mother, but they made her draw back into the room immediately. On arriving in the street, we met the boys from a college, who were passing in double file, and on catching sight of the coffin, with the medal and the schoolmistresses, they all pulled off their hats. Poor little boy! He went to sleep forever with his medal. We shall never see his red cap again. He was in perfect health. In four days he was dead. On the last day he made an effort to rise and study his lesson, and he insisted on keeping his medal on his bed for fear it would be taken from him. No one 
will ever take it from you again poor boy farewell farewell we shall always remember you at the baretti school sleep in peace dear little boy the eve of the fourteenth of march today has been more cheerful than yesterday the thirteenth of march the eve of the distribution of prizes at the theatre victor emmanuel the greatest and most beautiful festival of the whole year but this time the boys who are to go upon the stage and give the certificates of the prizes to the gentlemen who are to present them are not to be taken at haphazard the principal came in this morning at the close of school and said good news boys then he called Karachi, the calabrian the calabrian rose would you like to be one of those to carry the certificates of the prizes to the authorities in the theatre tomorrow the calabrian answered that he should that is well said the principal then there will also be a representative of calabria there and that will be a fine thing the municipal council is desirous that this year the ten or twelve lads who hand the prizes should be from all parts of italy and selected from all the public school buildings we have twenty buildings with five annexes seven thousand pupils among such a multitude there has been no difficulty in finding one boy for each region of italy two representatives of the islands were found in the Torquato tasso schoolhouse a sardinian and a sicilian the bon compagni school furnished a little florentine the son of a woodcarver there is a roman a native of rome in the tomasio building several venetians lombards and natives of romana have been found the monviso school gives us a neapolitan the son of an officer we furnish a genoese and a calabrian you caracci with the piedmontese that will make twelve does this not strike you as nice it will be your brothers from all quarters of italy who will give you your prizes mind the whole twelve will appear on the stage together receive them with hearty applause they are only boys but they represent the country just as though they were men a small tricolored flag is the symbol of italy as much as a huge banner is it not applaud them warmly then let it be seen that your little hearts are all aglow that your souls of ten years grow enthusiastic in the presence of the sacred image of your fatherland having spoken thus he went away and the teacher said with a smile so caracci you are to be the deputy from calabria and then all clapped their hands and laughed and when we got into the street we surrounded caracci seized him by the legs lifted him on high and set out to carry him in triumph shouting hurrah for the deputy of calabria by way of making a noise of course and not in jest but quite the contrary for the sake of making a celebration for him and with a good will for he is a boy who pleases every one and he smiled and thus we bore him as far as the corner where we ran into a gentleman with a black beard who began to laugh the calabrian said that is my father then the boys placed his son in his arms and ran away in all directions the distribution of prizes march fourteenth towards two o'clock the great theatre was crowded pit 
gallery, boxes, stage, all were thronged. Thousands of faces, boys, gentlemen, teachers, workingmen, women of the people, babies. There was a moving of heads and hands, a flutter of feathers, ribbons, and curls, and a loud and merry murmur which inspired cheerfulness. The theater was decorated with festoons of white, red, and green cloth. In the pit, two little stairways had been erected, one on the right, which the winners of prizes were to ascend in order to reach the stage, the other on the left, which they were to descend after receiving their prizes. On the front of the platform was a row of red chairs, and from the back of the one in the center hung two laurel crowns. At the back of the stage was a trophy of flags. On one side stood a small green table, and upon it lay all the certificates of premiums tied with the tricolored ribbons. The band was stationed in the pit, under the stage. The schoolmasters and mistresses filled all one side of the first balcony, which had been reserved for them. The benches and passages of the pit were crammed with hundreds of boys, who were to sing and who carried the music in their hands. At the back and all about, masters and mistresses could be seen going to and fro, arranging the prize scholars in lines, and it was full of parents who were giving a last touch to their hair and the last pull to their neckties. No sooner had I gone in a box with my family than I perceived in the opposite box the young mistress with a red feather, who was smiling and showing all the pretty dimples in her cheeks, and with her my brother's teacher and the little nun, dressed wholly in black, and my kind mistress of the upper first. But she was so pale, poor thing, and coughed so hard that she could be heard all over the theatre. In the pit, I instantly espied Garoni's dear big face and the little blonde head of Nelly, who was clinging close to the other's shoulder. A little further on, I saw Garofi, with his owl-beaked nose, who was making great efforts to collect the printed catalogues of the prize winners. He already had a large bundle of them, which he could put to some use in his bartering. We shall find out what it is tomorrow. Near the door was the wood seller with his wife, both dressed in holiday attire, together with their boy, who has a third prize in the second grade. I was amazed at no longer beholding the catskin cap and the chocolate-covered jerkin. On this occasion he was dressed like a little gentleman. In one balcony I caught a momentary glimpse of Otini, with a large lace collar. Then he disappeared. In a proscenium box, filled with people, was the artillery captain, the father of Robetti, the boy with the crutches. On the stroke of two, the band struck up, and at the same moment the mayor, the prefect, the judge, the assessor, and many other gentlemen, all dressed in black, mounted the stairs on the right, and seated themselves on the red chairs at the front of the platform. The band ceased playing. The director of singing in the schools advanced with a baton in his hand. At a signal from him, all the boys in the pit rose to their feet. At another sign, they began to sing. There were seven hundred singing a very beautiful song. Seven hundred boys' voices, singing together. How beautiful! All listened motionless. It was a slow, sweet, limpid song, which seemed like a church chant. When they ceased, everyone applauded. Then they all became very still. The distribution of the prizes was about to begin. My little master of the second grade, with his red head and his quick eyes, who was to read the names of the prize winners, had already advanced to the front of the stage. The entrance of the twelve boys, 
who were to present the certificates was what they were waiting for the newspapers had already stated that there would be boys from all the provinces of italy everyone knew it and was watching for them and gazing curiously towards the spot where they were to enter and the mayor and the other gentlemen gazed also and the whole theatre was silent all at once the whole twelve arrived on the stage at a run and remained standing there in line with a smile the whole theatre three thousand persons sprang up as one breaking into applause which sounded like a clap of thunder the boys stood for a moment as though disconcerted behold italy said a voice on the stage i recognized caracci the calabrian dressed in black as usual a gentleman belonging to the municipal council who was with us and who knew them all pointed them out to my mother that little blonde is the representative of venice the roman is that tall curly-haired lad yonder two or three of them were dressed like gentlemen the others were sons of workingmen but all were neatly clad and clean the florentine who was the smallest had a blue scarf round his body they all passed in front of the mayor who kissed them one after the other on the brow while a gentleman seated next to him smilingly told him the names of their cities florence naples bologna palermo and as each passed by the whole theatre clapped then they all ran to the green table to take the certificates the master began to read the list mentioning the schoolhouses the classes the names and the prize winners began to mount the stage and to file past the foremost ones had hardly reached the stage when behind the scenes was heard a very very faint music of violins which did not cease during the whole time that they were filing past a soft and always even ear like the murmur of many subdued voices the voices of all the mothers and all the masters and mistresses giving counsel and concert and beseeching and administering loving reproofs and meanwhile the prize winners passed one by one in front of the seated gentlemen who handed them their certificates and said a word or bestowed a caress on each the boys in the pit and the balconies applauded loudly every time there passed a very small lad or one who seemed from his garments to be poor and also for those who had abundant curly hair who were clad in red or white some of those who filed past belonged to the upper primary and once arrived there they became confused and did not know where to turn and the whole theatre laughed one passed three hands high with a big knot of pink ribbon on his back so that he could hardly walk and he got entangled in the carpet and tumbled down the prefect set him on his feet again and all laughed and clapped another rolled headlong down the stairs when going back to the pit cries arose but he had not hurt himself boys of all sorts passed boys with roguish faces with frightened faces with faces as red as cherries comical little fellows who laughed in everyone's face and no sooner had they got back into the pit than they were seized upon by their fathers and mothers who carried them away when our schoolhouse's turn came how interested i was many whom i knew passed coretti filed by dressed in new clothes from head to foot with his fine merry smile which displayed all his white teeth but who knows how many loads of wood he had already carried that morning the mayor on presenting him with his certificate inquired the meaning of a red mark on his forehead and as he did so laid one hand on his shoulder i looked in the pit for his father and mother 
and saw them laughing while they covered their mouths with one hand then derossi passed all dressed in bright blue with shining buttons with all those golden curls slender easy with his head held high so handsome and fine that i could have blown him a kiss and all the gentlemen wanted to speak to him and to shake his hand then the master cried giulio robetti and we saw the captain's son come forward on his crutches hundreds of boys knew the occurrence a word ran round in an instant a salvo of applause broke forth and of shouts which made the theatre shake men sprang to their feet ladies began to wave their handkerchiefs and the poor boy halted in the middle of the stage amazed and trembling the mayor drew him to him gave him his prize and a kiss and removing the two laurel crowns which were hanging from the back of the chair he strung them on the crossbars of his crutches then he led him to the stage box where his father the captain was seated and the latter lifted him bodily and set him down inside amid an indescribable tumult of bravos and hurrahs meanwhile the soft and gentle music of the violins did not cease and the boys continued to file by those from the consolata school nearly all the sons of petty merchants those from the vanquilia school the sons of workingmen those from the bon Campani school many of whom were the sons of peasants those of the reineri which was the last as soon as it was over the seven hundred boys in the pit sang another very beautiful song then the mayor spoke and after him the judge who ended by saying to the boys do not leave this place without greeting those who toil so hard for you who have consecrated to you all the strength of their intelligence and of their hearts who live and die for you there they are behold them and he pointed to the balcony of teachers then from the balconies from the pit from the boxes the boys rose and extended their arms towards the masters and mistresses with a shout and the latter responded by waving their hands their hats and handkerchiefs as they all stood up much moved after this the band played once more and the audience sent a last noisy salute to the twelve lads of all the provinces of italy who presented themselves at the front of the stage all drawn up in a line with their hands joined beneath a shower of flowers end of section thirteen section fourteen of heart a schoolboy's journal this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nemo Heart A Schoolboy's Journal by Edmondo de Amicis Translated by Isabel Florence Hapgood March The Quarrel Monday, 26th It was not out of envy, because he got the prize and I did not, that I quarreled with Coretti this morning no it was not out of envy still i was in the wrong the teacher had placed him beside me and i was writing in my copy-book when he jogged my elbow and made me blot and soil the monthly story blood of romana which i was to copy for the little mason who is ill i got angry and said a rude word to him he replied with a smile i did not do it on purpose i should have believed him 
because I know him, but it displeased me that he should smile, and I thought, oh, now that he has had a prize, he has grown saucy. And a little while afterwards, to revenge myself, I gave him a jog which made him spoil his page. Then, all crimson with wrath, you did that on purpose, he said to me, and raised his hand. The teacher saw it, he drew it back, but he added, I shall wait for you outside. I felt ill at ease. My wrath had simmered away. I repented. No, Coretti could not have done it intentionally. He is good, I thought. I recalled how I had seen him in his own home, how he had worked and helped his sick mother, and then how heartily he had been welcomed in my house, and how he had pleased my father. What would I not have given not to have said that word to him, not to have insulted him, and I thought of the advice that my father had given to me. Have you done wrong? Yes. Then beg his pardon. But this I did not dare to do. I was ashamed to humiliate myself. I looked at him out of the corner of my eye, and I saw his coat ripped on the shoulder, perhaps because he had carried too much wood, and I felt that I loved him. I said to myself, Courage! But the words, Pardon me, stuck in my throat. He looked at me askance from time to time, but seemed more grieved than angry. And I looked crossly at him to show him that I was not afraid. He repeated, We shall meet outside. And I said, We shall meet outside. But I was thinking of what my father had once said to me. If you are in the wrong, defend yourself but do not fight. And I said to myself, I will defend myself, but I will not fight. But I was discontented, and I no longer listened to the master. At last, the moment of dismissal arrived. When I was alone in the street, I perceived that he was following me. I stopped and waited for him, ruler in hand. He came up, and I raised my ruler. No, Enrico, he said, with his kindly smile, waving the ruler aside with his hand. Let us be friends again, as before. I stood still, in amazement, and then I felt what seemed to be a push on my shoulders, and I found myself in his arms. He kissed me and said, We'll have no more quarrels, will we? Never again, never again, I replied, and we parted content. But when I went home and told my father all about it, thinking to give him pleasure, his face clotted over, and he said, You should have been the first to offer your hand, since you were in the wrong. Then he added, You should not raise your ruler at a comrade who is better than you are at the son of a soldier, and snatching the ruler from my hand, he broke it in two and hurled it against the wall. My Sister, Friday, 24th Why, Enrico, after father had already reproved you for behaving badly to Coretti, were you so unkind to me? You cannot imagine the pain that you caused me. Do you not know that when you were a baby, I stood for hours and hours beside your cradle, instead of playing with my companions? And then when you were ill, I got out of bed every night to feel whether your forehead was burning. Do you not know, you who grieve your sister, that if a dreadful misfortune should overtake us, I should be a mother to you and love you like my son? Do you not know that when our father and mother are no longer here, 
i shall be your best friend the only person with whom you can talk about our dead and your childhood and that should it be necessary i shall work for you enrico to earn your bread and to pay for your studies and that i shall always love you when you are grown up that i shall follow you in thought when you go far away always because we grew up together and have the same blood enrico be sure of this when you are a man that if misfortune happens to you if you are alone be very sure that you will seek me that you will come to me and say sylvia sister let me stay with you let us talk of the days when we were happy do you remember let us talk of our mother of our home of those beautiful days that are so far away oh enrico you will always find your sister with her arms wide open yes dear enrico you must forgive me for the reproof that i am giving now i shall never recall any wrong of yours and if you should give me other sorrows what matters it you will always be my brother the same brother i shall never recall you otherwise than as having held you in my arms when a baby of having loved our father and mother with you of having watched you grow up of having been for years your most faithful companion but do you write me a kind word in this same copy-book and i will come for it and read it before the evening in the meanwhile to show you that i am not angry with you and nothing that you are weary i have copied for you the monthly story blood of romana which you were to have copied for the little sick mason look in the left drawer of your table i have been writing all night while you were asleep write me a kind word enrico i beg of you your sister sylvia i am not worthy to kiss your hands enrico blood of romana monthly story that evening the house of ferruccio was more silent than it was wont the father who kept a little dry goods shop had gone to forli to make some purchases and his wife had accompanied him with luigina a baby whom she was taking to a doctor that he might operate on a diseased eye they were not to return until the following morning it was almost midnight the woman who came to do the work by day had gone away at nightfall in the house there was only the grandmother with the paralyzed legs and ferruccio a lad of thirteen it was a small house of but one story situated on the highway at a gunshot's distance from a village not far from forli a town of romana and there was near it an uninhabited house ruined two months previously by fire and on which the sign of an inn was still to be seen behind the tiny house was a small garden surrounded by a hedge upon which a rustic gate opened the door of the shop which also served as the house door opened on the highway all around spread the solitary country wide cultivated fields planted with mulberry trees it was nearly midnight it was raining and blowing ferruccio and his grandmother were still up sitting in the dining room between which and the garden was a small closet-like room with old furniture ferruccio had returned home only at eleven o'clock after an absence of many hours and his grandmother had watched for him with eyes wide open filled with anxiety she sat in the large armchair upon which she was accustomed to pass the entire day and often the whole night as well since the difficulty of breathing did not allow her to lie down in bed the wind and rain beat against the window panes the night was very dark ferruccio had returned weary 
muddy with his jacket torn, and the livid mark of a stone on his forehead. He had engaged in a stone fight with his comrades. They had come to blows, as usual, and, in addition, he had gambled and lost all of his soldi, and left his cap in a ditch. Although the kitchen was lighted only by a small oil lamp placed on the corner of the table near the armchair, his poor grandmother had instantly seen the wretched condition of her grandson, and had partly divined, partly brought him to confess his misdeeds. She loved this boy with all her soul. When she had learned all, she began to cry. Ah, oh, no, she said after a long silence. You have no heart for your poor grandmother. You have no feeling to take advantage in this manner of the absence of your father and mother to cause me sorrow. You have left me alone the whole day long. You had not the slightest compassion. Take care, Ferruccio. You are entering on an evil path which leads you to a sad end. I have seen others begin like you and come to a bad end. If you begin by running away from home, by getting into brawls with other boys, by losing soldi, then gradually from stone fights you will come to knives, from gambling to other vices, and from other vices to theft. Ferruccio stood listening three paces away, leaning against a cupboard, with his chin on his breast and his brows knit, being still hot with wrath from the brawl. A lock of fine chestnut hair fell across his forehead, and his blue eyes were motionless. From gambling to theft, repeated his grandmother, continuing to weep. Think of it, Ferruccio. Think of that scourge of the country about here, of that Vito Mazzoni, who is now playing the vagabond in the town, who at the age of twenty-four has been twice in prison, and has made that poor woman his mother die of a broken heart. I knew her, and his father has fled to Switzerland in despair. Think of that bad fellow, who salute your father is ashamed to return. He is always roaming with miscreants worse than him, and some day he will go to the galleys. Well, I knew him as a boy, and he began as you are doing. Reflect that you will reduce your father and mother to the same end as his. Ferruccio held his peace. He was not bad at heart, quite the reverse. His pranks arose rather from an overflow of life and boldness than from an evil mind. And his father had managed him badly just here, for he gave him great liberty, because he knew him to be good-hearted and capable, at bottom of the finest sentiments. So he left the bridle loose upon the boy's neck, and waited for him to acquire judgment for himself. The lad was good rather than perverse, but stubborn, and it was hard for him, even when his heart was repentant, to allow those good words which win pardon to escape his lips. If I have done wrong, I will do so no more. I promise it. Forgive me. His soul was full of tenderness at times, but pride would not permit it to show itself. Ah, Ferruccio, continued his grandmother, seeing that he was silent, not a word of penitence to me? You see to what a condition I am reduced, so that I am as good as actually buried. You ought not to have the heart to make me suffer so, to make the mother of your mother, who is so old and so near her last day, weep. The poor grandmother, who has always loved you so, who rocked you all night long, night after night when you were a baby, a few months old, and who did not eat in order to play with you. You do not know that I always said, this boy will be my consolation. And now you are killing me. 
I would willingly give the little life that remains to me if I could see you become a good boy and an obedient boy, as you were in those days when I used to lead you to the sanctuary. Do you remember, Ferruccio? You used to fill my pockets with pebbles and weeds, and I carried you home in my arms fast asleep. You used to love your poor grandma then, and now I am a paralytic and in need of your affection as of the air to breathe, since I have no one else in the world, poor, half-dead woman that I am. Ferruccio was on the point of running to his grandmother, overcome with sorrow, when he fancied that he heard a slight noise, a creaking in the small adjoining room, the one which opened on the garden. But he could not make out whether it was the window shutters rattling in the wind or something else. He bent his head and listened. The rain beat down noisily. The sound was repeated. His grandmother heard it also. What is it? she asked anxiously. After a pause, the rain, murmured the boy. Then, Ferruccio, said the old woman, drying her eyes, you promise me that you will be good, that you will not make your poor grandmother weep again? Another faint sound interrupted her. But it seems to me that it is not the rain, she exclaimed, turning pale. Go and see. But she instantly added, No, stay here, and seized Ferruccio by the hand. Both remained as they were and held their breath. All they heard was the sound of the water. Then both were seized with a shivering fit. It seemed to them that they heard footsteps in the next room. Who's there? demanded the lad, recovering his breath with an effort. No one replied. Who is it? asked Ferruccio again, chilled with terror. But hardly had he pronounced these words when both uttered a shriek of terror. Two men sprang into the room. One of them grasped the boy and placed one hand over his mouth. The other clutched the old woman by the throat. The first said, Silence, unless you want to die. The second said, Be quiet, and raised aloft a knife. Both had dark cloths over their faces with holes for the eyes. For a moment nothing was heard but the gasping breath of all four in the patter of the rain. The old woman rattled in her throat, and her eyes were starting from her head. The man who held the boy said in his ear, Where does your father keep his money? The lad replied faintly, between chattering teeth, Yonder in the cupboard. Come with me said the man, and he dragged him into the closet room, holding him securely by the throat. There was a dark lantern standing on the floor. Where is the cupboard? he demanded. The gasping boy pointed it out. Then, in order to make sure of the boy, the man flung him on his knees in front of the cupboard, pressing his neck closely between his own legs in such a way that he could throttle him if he shouted. Holding his knife in his teeth and his lantern in one hand, with the other he pulled from his pocket a pointed iron, drove it into the lock, fumbled about, broke it, threw the doors wide open, tumbled everything over in a perfect fury of haste, filled his pockets, shut the cupboard again, opened it again, made another search, then he seized the boy by the windpipe and pushed him to where the other man was still grasping the old woman, who was in a swoon, with her head thrown back and her mouth open. That one asked in a low voice, Did you find it? His companion replied, I found it, and he added, See to the door. The one that was holding the old woman ran to the door of the garden to see if there were any one there, and called in from the little room in a voice that resembled a hiss, Come! 
the one who stayed behind and who was still holding ferruccio fast showed his knife to the boy and the old woman who had opened her eyes again and said not a sound or i'll come back and cut your throat and he glared at the two for a moment at this juncture they heard a song sung by many voices far off on the highway the robber turned his head hastily towards the door and the violence of the movement caused the cloth to fall from his face the old woman gave a shriek mozzoni a cursed woman roared the robber on finding himself recognized you shall die he hurled himself with his knife raised against the old woman and she fainted away the assassin dealt the blow but Ferruccio, with an exceedingly rapid movement and uttering a cry of desperation had rushed to his grandmother and covered her body with his own the assassin fled stumbling against the table and overturning the light which was extinguished the boy slipped slowly from above his grandmother fell on his knees and remained in that attitude with his arms around her body and his head upon her breast several moments passed it was very dark the song of the peasants gradually died away the old woman recovered her senses Ferruccio, she cried with chattering teeth in a voice that was barely intelligible grandmother replied the lad the old woman made an effort to speak but terror had paralyzed her tongue she remained silent for a while quivering violently at last she succeeded in asking they are not here now no they did not kill me murmured the old woman in a stifled voice no you are safe said ferruccio in a weak voice you are safe dear grandmother they carried off the money but father had taken nearly all of it with him his grandmother drew a deep breath grandmother said ferruccio still kneeling and pressing her close to him dear grandmother you love me don't you oh ferruccio my poor little son she replied placing her hands on his head what a fright you must have had o oh, lord god of mercy light the lamp no let us remain in the dark i am still afraid grandmother resumed the boy i have always caused you grief no ferruccio you must not say such things i shall never think of that again i have forgotten everything i love you so dearly i have always caused you grief pursued ferruccio with difficulty and his voice shook but i have always loved you do you forgive me forgive me grandmother yes my son i forgive you with all my heart think how could i help forgiving you rise from your knees my child i will never scold you again you are so good so good let us light the lamp let us take courage a little rise ferruccio thanks grandmother said the boy and his voice was still weaker now i am content you will remember me grandmother will you not you will always remember me your ferruccio my ferruccio exclaimed his grandmother amazed and alarmed as she laid her hands on his shoulders and bent her head as though to look him in the face remember me murmured the boy once more in a voice that seemed like a breath give a kiss to my mother 
to my father to luigina good-bye grandmother in the name of heaven what is the matter with you shrieked the old woman feeling the boy's head anxiously as it lay upon her knees and then with all the power of voice of which her throat was capable and in desperation ferruccio 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 my child my love angels of paradise come to my aid but ferruccio made no reply the little hero the saviour of the mother of his mother stabbed in the back by a blow from a knife had given up his noble daring soul to god the little mason on his sickbed tuesday twenty eighth poor muratorino is seriously ill the master told us to go and see him and grone Dorosi and i agreed to go together stadi would have come also but the teacher had assigned us the description of the monument to cavour he told us that he must go and see the monument in order that his description might be more exact so by way of experiment we invited that puffed-up fellow nobis who replied no and nothing more Votini also excused himself, perhaps because he was afraid of soiling his clothes with plaster. We went there when we came out of school at four o'clock. It was raining in torrents. On the street, Garone halted and said, with his mouth full of bread, what shall I buy? And he rattled a couple of soldi in his pocket we gave two soldi each and bought three big oranges we went up to the garret at the door Dorosi took off his medal and put it in his pocket i asked him why i don't know he answered in order not to put on airs it strikes me as more delicate to go in without my medal we knocked the father that big man who looks like a giant opened to us his face was sad and drawn who are you he asked garoni replied we are antonio's schoolmates and we have brought him some oranges ah poor tonino exclaimed the mason shaking his head i fear that he will never eat your oranges and he wiped his eyes with the back of his hand. He made us come in. We entered an attic room where we saw the little mason asleep in a little iron bed. His mother hung dejectedly over the bed with her face in her hands, and she hardly turned to look at us. On one side hung brushes, a trowel, and a plaster sieve over the feet of the sick boy was spread the mason's jacket white with lime the poor boy was thin and very very white his nose was pointed and his breath was short oh dear tonino my little comrade you who were so kind and merry how it pains me what would i not give to see you make that hare's face once more poor little mason garoni laid an orange on his pillow close to his face the odor waked him he grasped it instantly then let go of it and gazed intently at garoni it is i said the latter garoni do you know me he smiled faintly, lifted his stubby hand with difficulty from the bed, and held it out to Garoni, who took it between his and laid it against his cheek, saying, Courage, courage, little mason, 
you are going to get well soon and come back to school and the teacher will put you next to me will that please you but the little mason made no reply his mother burst into sobs oh my poor tonino my poor tonino he is so brave and good and god is going to take him from us silence cried the mason silence for the love of god or i shall lose my reason then he said to us with anxiety go go boys i thank you go what could you do here i thank you go home the boy had closed his eyes again and appeared to be dead do you need any assistance asked Goroni. no my good boy thank you the mason answered and so saying he pushed us out on the landing and shut the door but we were not halfway down the stairs when we heard him calling Goroni, Goroni. we all three mounted the stairs once more in haste Goroni, shouted the mason with a changed countenance he has called you by name it is two days since he spoke he has called you twice he wants you come quickly ah holy god if this is only a good sign farewell for the present said garoni to us i shall remain and he ran in with the father Dorosi's eyes were full of tears are you crying for the little mason i said he has spoken he will recover i believe it replied Dorosi. but i was not thinking of him i was thinking how good garoni is what a beautiful soul he has count cavour wednesday twenty ninth you are to write a description of the monument to count cavour you can do it but who was count cavour you cannot understand a present for the present this is all you know he was for many years the prime minister of piedmont it was he who sent the piedmontese army to the crimea to raise once more with the victory of sernaya our military glory which had fallen with the defeat at novara it was he who made one hundred and fifty thousand frenchmen descend from the alps to chase the austrians from lombardy it was he who governed italy in the most solemn period of our revolution who gave during those years the most potent impulse to the holy enterprise of the unification of our country he with his brilliant mind with his invincible perseverance with his more than human industry many generals have passed terrible hours on the field of battle but he passed more terrible ones in his cabinet when his enormous work might suffer destruction at any moment like a fragile edifice at the tremor of an earthquake hours nights of struggle and anguish did he pass sufficient to make him issue from it with reason deranged and death in his heart and it was this gigantic and stormy work which shortened his life by twenty years nevertheless devoured by the fever which was to cast him into his grave he yet contented desperately with a malady in order to accomplish something for his country it is strange he said sadly on his deathbed i no longer know how to read i cannot read while they were bleeding him and the fever was increasing he was thinking of his country and he said imperiously cure me my mind is clouding over i have need of all my faculties to manage important affairs 
during his last moments, when the whole city was in a tumult, and the king stood at his bedside, he said anxiously, I have many things to say to you, sire, many things to show you, but I am ill, I cannot, I cannot, and he was in despair. His feverish thoughts hovered ever round the state, round the new Italian provinces, which had been united with us, round the many things which still remained to be done. While the delirium seized him, educate the children, he exclaimed, between his gasp for breath, educate the children, and the young people govern with liberty. His delirium increased, death hovered over him, and with burning words he invoked General Garibaldi, with whom he had had disagreements, and Venice, and Rome, which were not yet free. He had vast visions of the future of Italy and of Europe. He dreamed of a foreign invasion. He inquired where the corps of the army were, and the generals. He still trembled for us, for his people. His great sorrow was not, you understand, that he felt that his life was going, but to see himself fleeing his country, which still had need of him, and for which he had, in a few years, worn out the measureless forces of his wonderful constitution. He died with a battle cry in his throat, and his death was as great as his life. Now reflect a little, Enrico, what sort of thing is our labor, which nevertheless so weighs us down? What are our griefs, our death itself, in the face of the toils and the terrible anxieties, the tremendous agonies of these men, upon whose hearts rest a world. Think of this, my son, when you pass before that marble image, and say, Glory, in your heart. Your Father. End of section 14. Section 15 of Heart, a Schoolboy's Journal. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Martin, Waterloo, Ontario, Canada. Heart, a Schoolboy's Journal, by Edmondo de Amicis. Translated by Isabel Florence Hapgood. April spring saturday first the first of april only three months more this has been one of the most beautiful mornings of the year i was happy in school because coretti told me to come day after tomorrow to see the king make his entrance we will go with his father who knows him also my mother had promised to take me the same day to visit the infant asylum in the Corso Valdocco. I was pleased, too, because the little mason is better, and because the teacher said to my father yesterday evening, as he was passing, he is doing well, he is doing well. And then it was a beautiful spring morning. From the school windows we could see the blue sky, the trees of the garden all covered with buds, and the wide open windows of the houses, with their boxes and vases already growing green. The teacher did not laugh, because he never laughs, but he was in good humor, so that the wrinkle hardly ever appeared on his brow, and he explained a problem on the blackboard, and jested. And it was plain that he felt a pleasure in breathing the air of the gardens which entered through the open window, redolent with the fresh odor of earth and leaves, which suggested thoughts of country rambles. While he was explaining, we could hear, in a neighboring street, a blacksmith hammering on his anvil, and in the house opposite, a woman singing to lull her baby to sleep. Far away, in the Cernea barracks, 
the trumpets were sounding. Everyone seemed glad, even Stardy. Presently the blacksmith began to hammer more vigorously, the woman to sing more loudly. The teacher paused and lent an ear. Then he said slowly as he gazed out of the window, The smiling sky, a singing mother, an honest man at work, boys at study. These are beautiful things. When we left school, we saw that everyone else was cheerful also. All walked in a line, stamping loudly with their feet and humming, as though on the eve of a four days' vacation. The schoolmistresses were playful. The one with the red feather tripped along behind the children like a schoolgirl. The parents of the boys were chatting together and smiling, and Crossy's mother, the vegetable vendor, had so many bunches of violets in her basket that they filled the whole large hall with perfume. I have never felt so glad as this morning on catching sight of my mother, who was waiting for me in the street, and I said to her as I ran to meet her, Oh, I am happy. What is it that makes me so happy today? And my mother answered smilingly that it was the beautiful season and a good conscience. King Umberto Monday, 3rd At ten o'clock precisely, my father, looking from the window, saw Coretti, the wood-seller, and his son waiting for me in the square, so he said, There they are, Enrico. Go and see your king. I went like a flash. Both father and son were even more alert than usual, and they never seemed to me to resemble each other so strongly as this morning. The father wore on his jacket the medal for valor between two commemorative medals, and his mustaches were curled and as pointed as two pins. We at once set out for the railway station, where the king was to arrive at half-past ten. Coretti, the father, smoked his pipe and rubbed his hands. "'Do you know,' said he, "'I have not seen him since the War of Sixty-Six. A trifle of fifteen years and six months. First, three years in France, and then at Mondavi. And here, where I might have seen him, I have never had the good luck of being in the city when he came. Such a piece of luck!' He called the king Umberto like a comrade. Umberto commanded the 16th Division. Umberto was twenty-two years and so many days old. Umberto mounted a horse thus and so. Fifteen years, he said vehemently, quickening his pace. I really have a great desire to see him again. I left him a prince. I see him once more a king. And I too have changed. From a soldier I have become a hawker of wood, and he laughed. If he were to see you, would he remember you? asked his son. He began to laugh. You are crazy, he answered. That's quite another thing. He, Umberto, was one single man. We were thick as flies, and then he never looked at us one by one. We turned into the course Victory Manuel. There were many people on their way to the station. A company of alpine soldiers passed with their trumpets. Two armed policemen passed by on horseback at a gallop. The day was calm and glorious. Yes, exclaimed the elder Coretti, growing animated. It is a real pleasure to me to see him once more, the general of my division. Ah, how quickly I have grown old. It seems as though it were only the other day that I had my knapsack on my shoulders and my gun in my hands. At that affair of the twenty fourth of June, when we were on the point of coming to blows, Umberto was going to and fro with his officers while the cannon were thundering in the distance, and every one was gazing at him, saying, May there not be a bullet for him also. I was a thousand miles from thinking that I should soon find myself so near him, in front of the lances of the Austrian Uhlans. Actually, only four paces from each other, boys. That was a fine day. The sky was like a mirror, but so hot. Let us see if we can get in. We had arrived at the station. There was a great crowd, carriages, policemen, carabiners, societies with banners. A regimental band was playing. The older Coretti attempted to enter the portico, but he was stopped. 
then it occurred to him to force his way into the front row of the crowd which formed an opening at the entrance and making way with his elbow he succeeded in thrusting us forward also but the shifting crowd flung us hither and thither the wood-seller got his eye upon the first pillar of the portico where the police did not allow any one to stand come with me he said suddenly dragging us by the hand and he crossed the empty space in two bounds and went and planted himself there with his back against the wall a police brigadier instantly hurried up and said to him you can't stand here i belong to the fourth battalion of the forty ninth replied coretti touching his medal the brigadier glanced at it and said stay where you are didn't i say so exclaimed coretti triumphantly it's a magic word that fourth of the forty ninth haven't i the right to see my general with some little comfort i who was in that squadron i saw him close at hand then it seems right that i should see him close at hand now and i say general he was my battalion commander for a good half hour for at such times while the racket was going he commanded the battalion himself and not major ubrich by heavens in the meantime in the reception room and outside a great mixture of officers and gentlemen was visible and in front of the door the carriages with the lackeys dressed in red were drawn up in a line coretti asked his father whether prince umberto had carried his sword in his hand when he was in a battle certainly he held his sword in his hand the latter replied to ward off a blow from a lance which might strike him as well as another ah those unchained demons they came down on us like the wrath of god they swept between the platoons the squadrons the cannon as though tossed by a hurricane crushing down everything there was a whirl of light cavalry of alessandria of lancers of Fogia, of infantry of sharpshooters a pandemonium in which nothing could be understood i heard the shout your highness your highness i saw the lowered lances approaching we discharged our guns a cloud of smoke hid everything then the smoke cleared away the ground was covered with horses and hewlands wounded or dead i turned around and beheld umberto in our midst on horseback gazing tranquilly about with the air of demanding have any of my lads received a scratch and we shouted hurrah right in his face like madmen heavens what a moment that was here's the train coming the band struck up the officers hastened forward the crowd stood on tiptoe eh he won't come out in a hurry said a policeman they are presenting him with an address now the elder coretti was beside himself with impatience ah when i think of it he said i always see him there of course there is cholera and there are earthquakes and in them too he bears himself bravely but i always have him before my mind as i saw him then among us with that quiet face i am sure that he too recalls the fourth of the forty ninth even now that he is king and that it would give him pleasure to have for once at a table together all those whom he saw about him at such moments now he has generals and great gentlemen and courtiers then there was no one but us poor soldiers if we could only exchange a few words alone our general of twenty-two our prince who was entrusted to our bayonets i have not seen him for fifteen years our umberto that's what he is ah that music stirs my blood on my word of honour an outburst of shouts interrupted him thousands of hats rose in the air four gentlemen dressed in black got into the first carriage tis he cried coretti and stood as though enchanted then he said softly by our lady how gray he has grown we all three uncovered our heads the carriage advanced slowly through the crowd who shouted and waved their hats i looked at the elder coretti he seemed to me another man he seemed to have become taller graver rather pale and fastened bolt upright against the pillar the carriage arrived in front of us 
a pace distant from the pillar. Hurrah! shouted many voices. Hurrah! shouted Coretti after the others. The king glanced at his face, and his eye dwelt for a moment on his three medals. Then Coretti lost his head and roared, The fourth battalion of the forty-ninth! The king, who had turned away, turned towards us again, and looking Coretti straight in the eye, reached his hand out of the carriage. Coretti gave one leap forwards and clasped it. The carriage passed on. The crowd broke in and separated us. We lost sight of the elder Coretti, but it was only for a moment. We found him again directly, panting with wet eyes, calling for his son by name and holding his hand on high. His son flew towards him, and he said, Here, little one, while my hand is still warm, and he passed his hand over the boy's face, saying, This is a caress from the king. And there he stood, as though in a dream, with his eyes fixed on the distant carriage, smiling, with his pipe in his hand, in the centre of a group of curious people who were staring at him. He's one of the 4th Battalion of the 49th, they said. He is a soldier that knows the king, and the king recognized him, and he offered him his hand. He gave the king a petition, said one more loudly. No, replied Coretti, whirling around abruptly. I did not give him any petition, but there is something else that I would give him if he were to ask it of me. They all stared at him. My blood, he said simply. THE INFANT ASYLUM TUESDAY, 4TH After breakfast yesterday, my mother took me, as she had promised, to the infant asylum in the Corso Valdocco, in order to recommend to the directress a little sister of Percossi. I had never seen an asylum, and I was greatly amused. There were two hundred of them, boy babies and girl babies, and so small that the children in our lower primary schools are men in comparison. We arrived just as they were going into the refectory in two files, where there were two very long tables, with a great many round holes, and in each hole a black bowl, filled with rice and beans, and a tin spoon beside it. On entering, some of the tots grew confused and remained on the floor until the mistress ran and picked them up. Many halted in front of a bowl, thinking it was their proper place, and had already swallowed a spoonful when a mistress came up and said, Go on! And then they went on three or four paces and got down another spoonful, and then advanced again, until they reached their own places, after having eaten half a portion more than was due them. At last, by dint of pushing and crying, Make haste! Make haste! They were all got into order, and the prayer was begun. But all those on the inner line, who had to turn their backs on the bowls for the prayer, twisted their heads round to keep an eye on them, lest someone might meddle. They said their prayer thus, with hands clasped and their eyes on the ceiling, but with their hearts on their food. Then they set to eating. Ah, what a charming sight it was! One ate with two spoons, another with his hands. Many picked up the beans one by one and thrust them into their pockets. Others wrapped them tightly in their little aprons and pounded them to reduce them to a paste. There were even some who did not eat because they were watching the flies flying, and others coughed and sprinkled a shower of rice all round them. It looked like a poultry yard, but it was fine. The two rows of babies formed a pretty sight with their hair all tied on the tops of their heads with red, green, and blue ribbons. One teacher asked a row of eight children, Where does rice grow? The whole eight opened their mouths wide, filled as they were with the pottage, and replied in concert in a sing-song, It grows in the water. Then the teacher gave the order, Hands up! And it was delightful to see all those little arms fly up, which a few months ago were in swaddling clothes and all those little hands waving, which looked like so many white and pink butterflies. Then they all went to play, but first they took their little baskets, which were hanging on the wall with their lunches in them. They went out into the garden and scattered round, and got out their provisions, 
bread stewed plums a tiny bit of cheese a hard-boiled egg little apples a handful of boiled vetches or a wing of chicken in an instant the whole garden was strewn with crumbs as though they had been scattered from their feed by a flock of birds they ate in all the queerest ways like rabbits like rats like cats nibbling licking sucking there was one child who held a bit of rye bread hugged closely to his breast and who was rubbing it with a medlar as though he were polishing a sword some of the little ones crushed in their fists small cheeses which trickled between their fingers like milk and ran down inside their sleeves and they were utterly unconscious of it they ran and chased each other with apples and rolls in their teeth like dogs i saw three of them digging out a hard-boiled egg with a straw thinking to discover treasures and they spilled half of it on the ground and then picked the crumbs up again one by one with great patience as though they had been pearls and those who had anything unusual were surrounded by eight or ten others who stood staring at the baskets with bent heads as you would look at the moon in a well there were twenty around a mite of a fellow who had a paper horn of sugar and they were going through all sorts of ceremonies with him for the privilege of dipping their bread in it and he gave it to some while after many prayers he only let others put a finger in in the meantime my mother had come into the garden and was petting now one and now another many hung about her and even on her back begging for a kiss with faces upturned as though to a third story and with mouths that opened and shut like birds asking for food one offered her the quarter of an orange which had been bitten another a small crust of bread one little girl gave her a leaf another showed her with all seriousness the tip of her forefinger a minute examination of which revealed a microscopic swelling which had been caused by touching the flame of a candle on the day before they placed before her eyes as great marvels very tiny insects which i cannot understand their being able to see and catch the halves of corks shirt buttons and flowerets pulled from the vases one child with a bandaged head who was determined to be heard at any cost stammered out to her some story about a head over heels tumble not one word of which was intelligible another insisted that my mother should bend down and then whispered in her ear my father makes brushes and all this while a thousand accidents were happening here and there which caused the teachers to hasten up children wept because they could not untie a knot in their handkerchiefs others disputed with scratches and shrieks the halves of an apple one child who had fallen face downward over a little bench which had been overturned wept amid the ruins and could not rise before her departure my mother took three or four of them in her arms and they ran up from all quarters to be taken also their faces smeared with the yolk of egg and orange juice one caught her hands another her finger to look at her ring another tugged at her watch chain another tried to seize her by the hair take care the teacher said to her they will tear your clothes all to pieces but my mother cared nothing for her dress and she continued to kiss them and they pressed closer and closer to her those who were nearest with their arms held out as though they were desirous of climbing the more distant trying to make their way through the crowd and all crying good-bye 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 at last she succeeded in escaping from the garden and they all ran and thrust their faces through the railings to see her pass and to put their arms through to greet her once more offering her bits of bread bites of apple cheese rinds and all screaming together good-bye 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 come back to-morrow come again as my mother made her escape she passed her hand once more over those hundreds of tiny outstretched hands as over a garland of living roses and finally reached the street in safety covered with crumbs and spots rumpled and disheveled with one hand full of flowers and her eyes swelling with tears and happy 
as though she had come from a festival and inside there was still audible a sound like the twittering of birds saying good-bye good-bye come again lady gymnastics wednesday fifth as the weather stays fine they have made us pass from indoor gymnastics to gymnastics with apparatus in the garden garonne was in the principal's office yesterday when nelly's mother that blonde woman dressed in black came in to get her son excused from the new exercises every word cost her an effort and as she spoke she held one hand on her son's head he is not able to do it she said to the principal but nelly seemed hurt at this exclusion from the apparatus at having this added humiliation imposed upon him you will see mamma he said that i shall do like the rest his mother gazed at him in silence with an air of pity and affection then she remarked in a hesitating way i fear lest his companions what she meant to say was lest they should make sport of him but nelly replied they will not do anything to me and then there is garonne it is enough for him to be present to prevent their laughing so he was allowed to come the teacher with the wound on his neck who was with garibaldi led us at once to the vertical bars which are very high and we had to climb to the very top and stand upright on the cross plank de rossi and coretti went up like monkeys even little precossi mounted briskly in spite of the fact that he was hindered by that jacket which extends to his knees and in order to make him laugh while he was climbing all the boys repeated his constant expression excuse me excuse me stardy puffed turned as red as a turkey cock and set his teeth until he looked like a mad dog but he would have reached the top at the expense of bursting and he actually did get there and so did nobis who when he reached the summit assumed the attitude of an emperor but votini slipped back twice notwithstanding his fine new suit with blue stripes which had been made expressly for gymnastics in order to climb the more easily all the boys had daubed their hands with resin which they call colophony and as a matter of course it is that trader of a garofi who provided every one with it selling it at a saldo the paper hornful and turning a pretty penny then it was garonne's turn and up he went chewing away at his bread as though it were nothing out of the common and i believe that he would have been capable of carrying one of us up on his shoulders for he is as muscular and strong as a young bull after garonne came nelly no sooner did the boys see him grasp the bars with those long thin hands of his than many of them began to laugh and to sing but garonne crossed his great arms on his breast and darted round a glance which was so expressive which so clearly said that he did not mind dealing out half a dozen punches even in the master's presence that they all ceased laughing on the instant nelly began to climb he tried hard poor little fellow his face grew purple he breathed with difficulty and the perspiration poured from his brow the master said come down but he would not he strove and persisted. I expected every moment to see him fall headlong, half dead. Poor Nelly! I thought, what if I had been like him, and my mother had seen me? How she would have suffered, poor mother! And, as I thought of that, I felt so tenderly toward Nelly that I could have given anything to help him climb those bars, or boost him from below without being seen. Meanwhile, Garonne, de Rossi, and Coretti, were saying up with you nelly up with you try one effort more courage and nelly made one more violent effort uttering a groan as he did so and found himself within two spans of the plank bravo shouted the others courage one dash more and behold nelly was clinging to the plank all clapped their hands bravo said the teacher but that will do now come down but Nelly wished to go to the top, like the rest, and after a little exertion he succeeded in getting his elbows on the plank, then his knees, then his feet. At last he stood upright, panting.
panting and smiling, and gazed at us. We began to clap again, and then he looked into the street. I turned in that direction, and through the plants which cover the iron railing of the garden, I caught sight of his mother, passing along the sidewalk without daring to look. Nellie came down, and we all made much of him. He was excited and rosy, his eyes sparkled, and he no longer seemed like the same boy. At the close of school, when his mother came to meet him, and inquired with some anxiety, as she embraced him, "'Well, my poor son, how did it go? How did it go?' All his comrades replied, "'He did well! He climbed like the rest of us! He's strong, you know, he's active, he does exactly like the others!' And the joy of that woman was a sight to see. She tried to thank us and could not. She shook hands with three or four, patted Garon, and carried off her son, and we watched them for a while, walking fast, talking and gesticulating, both perfectly happy, as though no one were looking at them. End of section 15